Hey, this is Roy from Nausea, and now currently of ministry, you're watching Crash and Bleed. Those original Nausea records? Oh, yeah. Like original Profane Existence copies? That's the original pressing, that's what Victor sent me. Both of them? And that's the reissue. But they're both originals. Oh, right on. Oh, that's great. Uh, cool. I think I've got everything the band have ever officially released. Not yet. We've got a couple more things coming out. Oh, really? Well, I remastered everything, so now it just sounds a million times better and just more in your face and punchier. Like, I could never listen to that record because I never liked the way it sounded. And the way it was mixed was, to me, it was atrocious. And then we went and made it, remixed it a second time with Don Fury, and that was good. So what I took was the original second Don Fury mix with the master, untouched. And gave it to my friend who is a mastering engineer and he put it through the right processing that it always needed and now it sounds like how it's supposed to sound and that's coming out on smart records in about a few months just to let you oh, know really yeah i saw on your instagram as well there was some like new merch or something coming yep there's new merch we finally own our own merch now which we never had before um it's, it's officially from us and made through this other company called Dead City, which are great. Uh, our friend Jimmy Gestapo from Murphy's Law turned us on to this guy. He does a lot of the New York hardcore bands. So it's a, it's, a, it's a good deal for us and still in the same vein and to the same crowd. So it's good, good place for us. And uh, yeah, we got that EP coming out of all the seven inches, all, all two seven inches on, um, on uh, LP, EP vinyl on Smart. I think you saw that. That's yeah, all yeah. Re- remastered and everything. Yeah. Well, so since you mentioned hardcore, let's go back and, and talk about how you got involved in the New York hardcore scene back then. Well, oddly enough, I didn't start in New York City, though I was born in New York. Um, lived there the first five, six years of my life and uh, moved out to Florida and with my parents. You know, my dad got a really kick ass job down there and then. Fortunately, my parents got divorced. I ended up moving back up north and mo- ended up moving to Pennsylvania because we just couldn't afford to live in New York. So I grew up in Pennsylvania from, you know, kid to about late teenager. And that's where I got into the punk scene there, where I was living. I was living in a place called Allentown, which is in the Lehigh Valley area. And there was a kick-ass punk scene there in the mid-80s. And luckily, I, you know, I found my tribe of people and met other kids that played you know, bass and guitar, had people that, that played instruments and then just created a band from there and then went from there, you know. I was about 14, 15. I was in this band called The Earthquake. It was my first band. Totally fast punk hardcore, you know, like RKL, MDC, like that kind of fast hardcore. Um, and then from there, I, I ended up uh, ended up coming to New York a lot, just going to see shows and meeting a lot of people. And I lived in Philadelphia for a little while before moving back to New York and then uh, ran into some people that knew guys in Nausea. I've met Nausea before I was joining the band and then I got wind that they needed a drummer. I ended up moving to New York, on, you know, and joined the band and the rest is history from there. There's a, there's a lot of, there's, there's a lot more shit in between 14 and 18 years old, but it's just taking me forever to explain it all. But yeah, it's basically how it went. Okay. I went Allentown, Philly, back to New York, joined Nausea. Made an album. That one, right behind you. <laughs> so, who were the most influential drummers at that time? At the time? Um, at that time, I was listening to, like, you're talking about, like, later 80s. I was probably listening to just Dave Lombardo and, uh, you know, Lars Ulrich at that time. Rain and Blood and Master of Puppets, those two records, you know. In that genre, and metal was like that was my shit. 
But I was also, you know, coming out of listening to Discharge and Black Flag and Dead Kennedy. So all those things mixed together, you know, I'm inspired by those drummers too, you know, Gary from Discharge or, you know, Filthy Phil from Motorhead, you know, guys like that. Like that was my 80s drummers, like for that, for that style, you know. It actually, I, I even throw in Dave Ruffy from The Ruts, which I really loved. I love The Ruts. Um, Paul Ferguson from Killing Joke, you know, guys like that. Yeah. Did you teach yourself? Pretty much for the most part. Um, when I was about, I've been playing since I was six, but then I started getting lessons around when I was eight. But that only lasted a month or two because the person who was teaching me ended up going on tour and never seen him again. So I basically taught myself after that and just remembered what he taught me, the basics, and just went with that. So, yeah, pretty much self-taught. Yeah. Well, obviously, you were in a couple of bands before Nausea, but were there any official recordings from that point? Not really. I mean, just demo tape stuff. I mean, there there is a, a, a demo of audio files floating around the internet now of, of my first band with you quake you can find that that's out there that was all done in my my bedroom there's two demos there's one where I, we did it in my bedroom where i used my brother's drum machine and i didn't program it i played it and we were going through this little radio shack realistic mixer like eight channels or something like that so i had a guitar player in one bass player in one vocalist in one and a stereo in from my a stereo in, input from my uh drum machine and I fed that to a tape deck and we just did it live like that. That was our first demo. After that, we had to sprint out a four track and recorded real drums and real everything. So yeah, there's only two demos of that. And then there's one other band after that, that my brother ended up joining in that Youthquake turned into a band called Word Made Flesh. And that was more, that was more melodic kind of punk. I had more of like a Buzzcocks, Ruts kind of vibe to it which I was really into at the time, still am. And then from there, I joined Nausea. Yeah. So could you talk about how you met each person in the band? Because we sort of know the story of how a few of those band members came together, but we don't know anything about Amy, who's kind of a mystery. It's like she just popped up in one of the greatest bands of all time, and then she disappears. Like, we don't know anything. <laughs> could you talk a little bit about how you met these guys? Well, when I first met Nausea, this is when I was still living in Pennsylvania. They came to a local venue that I used to go to a lot called uh, Oliver J's. And it was actually, Neil wasn't even in the band anymore at that point. So it was just Amy, Vic, John, and um, and uh, uh, Jimmy Williams, who was playing drums before me. He was a singer for Maximum Penalty. So I met all those guys. I met that version of it. And got to be friends with them and, you know, and then ran into them a couple of times after that. But then a mutual friend of ours, uh, of me and John John's, uh, this guy, Sean Roberts, who I was living with at the time in Philly, is the one that reached out to him to see if I was around and told him that we need a drummer. And then I went up and, you know, went up to New York City and tried out and then got the gig and moved all my shit up there. Yeah. Do you think maybe they'd seen you play and were impressed? That's why they wanted you in the band? I, I guess. I don't know. I just learned, I learned a bunch of their songs, came up there and just did it, you know. I got a demo tape, like with no vocals on it. It was just a raw demo. I think they made it with Josh Silver from Typo Negative. It was one of those demos. It's actually on that, that demo I'm talking about is on that Punk Terrorist uh, Volume 2 one. Yeah. That's what I listened to to, to learn these songs. Yeah. It's some, it's, some of it's on there. Yeah. But it was a tape. I had the tape of that. So it, I just went off of that. And some of the ones, some of the songs I already kind of knew because I've seen them, you know, a couple of times, just remembering. Yeah. yeah. Well, we should talk a little bit about the drummers that came before you because um, Pablo was first, wasn't he? Pablo was first. I didn't know him very well, though we did know each other, but we never really got to know each other as well as I wanted to. He passed away, unfortunately. Jimmy came in, I think he was in maybe a little bit longer than Pablo, maybe a year or two lo longer. And then he left and went off and did maximum penalty. And that's when I came in. So when you were li listening to the band, was there anything that caught your ear about their drumming that you were like, oh man, I, I can't wait to sort of try that song out? Well, they were just different to me. I never heard a band in my face right then and there that had a, a woman and a man singing like that, you know, 
it almost had resonated a bit of crass to me, but with a bit of a discharge edge to it and some crucifix thrown in there. That's that's what I got from it when I first heard and seen it. So that was my attraction to it. And musically, I just thought it was really cool and heavy and just different sounding compared to a lot of things that were going on at the time. You know, it's yeah. I mean, Victor's guitar is just his sound is just incredible. Hearing him for the first time, I was blown away. It was like, fuck, man, like the loudest, punchiest guitar I've ever heard in my life, like on a stage like that. And the way he plays, he has this like bluesy Tony Iommi way of playing, you know, dare I say that. He has that edge. It's a very soulful, really passionate player, you know. You can sing his leads. Kind of cool. Yeah, I've never, never, heard, it, ne- for quite a long never heard I never heard anyone like that in the scene. So it, it was it was mind blowing for me when I first heard it. So did you meet Amy before Nausea? Like before you started playing with them? Do you know if she was in another band before then? Or I didn't know Amy before the band. I only knew Amy when I joined the band. You know, I met Amy right as I joined the band. So I I don't didn't know her from before. Yeah. Victor said she she might have been a photographer, something like that. Yeah, definitely she was a photographer. I remember that. She t- definitely told me that, and I've seen her photos from you know before I joined the band. And yeah, she was a photographer. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So you join Nausea. What happens next? Do you go straight into the studio? Do you record demos with them? Honestly, I didn't even play a show with them straight away. When I joined the band, I ended up actually joining this other band with with uh, John John, and it was a band called Slaughter that turned into Jesus Christ, which was Neil from Nausea and Ralphie Boy from Disassociate. So I actually recorded and played a show with them first. And then months later, I entered the studio and recorded the record with Nausea. And then we played our first show, like I think either before that or after that, somewhere. I can't remember where my first show was with Nausea. I think it was at, I really can't remember where my first show was with Nausea. I can't. Yeah, you joined in in 1988. This was. I joined in '89. '89. Okay. I joined the summer of '89. Wasn't there like some unofficial releases that happened, like the Smash Racism EP? The only thing that came out before the record that I wasn't on was this compilation. Fuck the record, I can't remember. Uh, Born Against was on it. The Radics were on it. There were bands at that time, and it was a recording that Jimmy did. I think it might have been Productive Not Destructive. That song came out first on that comp. Actually, the comp, the, the, the song that really came out first for Nausea was on the Way It Is uh, hardcore compilation, uh, Fallout. That was the first Nausea. And that was before me. That was with uh, Pablo on drums. Yeah. Was he the fan favorite, do you think? Like the more preferred drummer just from the early days? I guess. I mean, he was he was preferred at the time. Jimmy was preferred at the time, and I was preferred at the time. I don't know. It's didn't really think of it like that. Oh, you're you're my favorite drummer to like play along to. That's like. Oh, all right. <laughs> Thanks, man. Hang on. Hello. He's doing an inter- interview. Sorry. So, I wanted to um, get into the recording of the Extinction LP, like. F- what you remember, but Victor sent me this a long time ago, this little patch. Oh, yeah, okay that? with the record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Wow, that's an original. So this was actually officially released with the album then? I thought maybe you just threw that in because he thinks I'm rad. <laughs> I think that came with the record. I think so. I'm not sure. I can't remember. All right. So Victor says this album was recorded in 10 hours. Can you confirm this? I, I remember it. I remember we recorded it. It was in the course of two days. I guess it was. I guess it was one full day. Yeah, we pretty much did everything, mixed it. That was it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Do you remember what the setup was like? Um, I remember the studio was called Purple Light, I think, or something like that. I can't remember. Um, I know it was on Broadway, off of Houston, on some in some corner building. It was like a few floors up, and I remember you walk in. It's like a little stretch of a hallway. It's a control room on this side, big live room there. And then to the left was an ISO booth. And that's where my drums were. Oddly enough, they stuck me in a little room 
I had this little window. I couldn't really see the band. So I'm like just playing, trying to make eye contact when to stop, you know, or when to start and stop. And we didn't really do multiple takes of songs. We just get we have only one take per song on those reels. And I think we might have like maybe played once, twice, three times, and then we kept recording over it until we got it right and moved on to the next song. Some shit like that. Or we just went for it, you know. We did it live. All that you hear is live. Do you remember what the newest track was at the time? Because Victor says a lot of those songs were like rehearsed over and over. I think Technologico was like the newest, the newer stuff. Technologico was newer. Inherit the Wasteland was newer. Um, Extinction was newer. I wrote that. I wrote that song. And uh, actually, John and I wrote that together. Um, that was the first song I, I brought up bring to the band. That was brand new. Um, Clutches and Godless, those were older songs before I was in the band. Johnny's Got His Gun. Uh, yeah, a lot. There's it it actually half and half. Half older and half newer. Yeah. So first three songs are pretty new. Yeah. Well, in that 10 hours, was anyone in the band struggling to get something down? Like, were they feeling the pressure from the time limit? I don't, I don't know that I can recall. I mean, I think most of it, it took that long, mostly, I think, probably just getting sounds in the beginning and, you know, just dialing in monitors and headphones and stuff like that, you know getting guitar sounds, overdubbing leads and shit like that. I don't know. I mean, we were pretty well rehearsed. I mean, we busted our asses before walking, working, walking into that studio. I mean, that's what you did back then. Nowadays, you just punch it in and cut and paste and all that stuff. I mean, you, back then, you had to play that shit. You had to know your shit, you know, because you only have limited time. So, and someone yeah. only this much, this amount of money, you had to get it done, you know. Do, so. <laughs> do you prefer that back in the day? In a way, yeah, because it keeps you on your toes and makes you work, makes you feel it. You feel it more, you know. The limitations make the limitations back then. I could say made you perform differently and and feel and think differently as of now, as of like today. Today, I mean, I, I love workflow, how the workflow is today. But I could recall though a different mindset, you know, back then when you were recording, on to tape and all that, you know. Well, you are one of the most insane drummers that I've got in my collection, so I can't imagine, oh. like, nailing some of those songs in one take, like, Godless, that's so tricky. I can't do it. I've <laughs> tried, I can't do it. Thanks, man. Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know, I just kind of, like, went with, went, went, went with the mindset of just got to get in there and fucking do it, you know? Just do it. Don't think about anything, just stay focused. Practice. So could you talk us through what's going on in that song, Battened, which is my favorite song from that album? It sounds like you've got a lot of like going to cymbals to snare, like da na na da na na But then on the second half of the first verse, that all kind of chills out. Are you then hitting the roids and then cymbals while going like that? It's da na na da 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 Actually, with the crash cymbals, I'm actually just accenting my kicks. So, yeah, you do the flow like that. Once you do that, the cymbals open up, and it just has this continuous wash of, you know, with little with the accents in between it. And that's something I just just instinctively figured out how to do. You know, just trying to remember, like hearing bands like Crucifix and Discharge. I want to. I want to mimic that so that's yeah. what i tried to do you know yeah can you remember what equipment you were using in the studio i don't remember i like tried to remember that because i i was when i was remastering the, the record i was trying to remember what we were using i don't remember the, the console i don't remember the tape machine but I do remember there was a lot of DBX compressors and stuff like that that were involved. I can I can remember that was around my drums and uh, the microphones. I don't remember. I, it was a lot. I don't remember. I remember the kit that I had. I had this Pearl Export or Pearl International drum kit, something like that. And I just got a DW uh, double pedal at the time, so I was just learning how to get that double bass going. You know. 
Well, I remember talking to Victor about Godless and Clutches because he said those two were his favorite songs. And I'm thinking the drums on Godless are just so badass, like the way you're hitting the snare. Oh, snare roll. And dude, yeah. dude, 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 dude. Was this important at the time, like the placements of the cymbal shots? Because you would do them and then you'd expect to hear them and then you wouldn't do them. And then you'd get that sort of excitement and anticipation for the next time they happen. Do you know what I mean? I'm just, I'm just following the riff. You know what I mean? Just follow the riff. That's all. Yeah. I, I think a better example of what I'm talking about here is in the song Sacrifice, where you kind of go, and then there's a snare roll, and then stop, and then a snare roll again. But by the time you get to the second verse, you don't stop. It's all snare rolls. Like, that's the kind of thing I mean. Like, was that important to the band members back then, like getting those specific fills into the songs? I think I, I probably felt that on the inside, like I've got to get this down. But I didn't really sit there and like explain it to anyone or to myself. No. I just did it. You know what I mean? <laughs> My inner monologue was not saying anything. It's just, it's just do it. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. I think that's the best way to, to put it. I don't think when I play, you know, I, I literally, I just turn it off and go into subconscious mode and just play. I think most musicians do. You know, when I, when I play live, I'm not thinking, I'm just doing it, you know, muscle memory. Yeah. Feel the music, so, you know, feel the, feel the players, you know, push and pull with the players, you know. But did you stick around for the recording of the vocals? Like, do you remember who was nailing it on the first take? Oh, they both were. They, they're both killing it, you know. There's actually, actually on the, on the, there's actually a couple takes on some songs by both vocalists. I, because I had the, the master reels and I could see it, um, I had them transferred. Uh, like alternate vibes of alternate ways of, of singing how they were and I could see where how it evolved into what we got now like there's one take of like Amy doing a, a godless one way and then there's another and then there's another take that we all know which was the better take the more angrier take you can hear her trying to figure out how she's going to do it and then the second take is the one yeah, yeah. it's pretty cool Dude. same thing with Al you know, one take is like, it's like you can hear him thinking about it. The second take, you hear him getting it. And then the third take, it's like, fuck yeah, right there. But the music, Dude. though, that was all done one shot. There was no punching in nothing on any of that record, except for when, you know, uh, uh, Victor, you know, punching in leads and stuff like that. Or Victor doing like a second guitar track. I think there's a couple of the songs where he, he just went for the lead during the main track. And just added a second guitar, or vice versa. Yeah, pretty cool. Well, it's pretty cool to hear. Yeah. Well, Amy's the reason that I got interested in the band in the first place. Like to me, she just sounded like some dynamite went off or something, you know? Oh, she was fucking amazing. Do you keep in touch with Amy? Oh yeah, talk to her all the time. Yeah, I keep in touch with everybody in the band. I miss I miss the whole band, like as people together in one room, I would love to have them all in one room, just one, one time, just give them all a hug. Yeah. I miss those guys. Well, I like to ask all my musical guests who they think was the most iconic punk rocker, maybe back then or now. Iconic punk rocker. <laughs> I don't know. Um, how, do you, how do I even answer that? I don't know. Most mostly people say Iggy Pop, but who was iconic to you? Iconic to me, David Bowie. You're gonna go in that genre. Yeah. yeah. It's not punk, but to me, it was his attitude. It's all about the attitude, right? Well, I mean, people call it punk. You can call it punk. I thought Jazz Coleman was fucking awesome. Killing Joke. Ian Curtis, Joy Division. Pete Shelley from Buzzcocks, you know. There's there's too many to name, but they're, they're all great. Cal, Cal from Discharge, Cynthia from Crucifix, I mean, Lemmy from Motorhead, I mean, the list goes on. <laughs> Henry Rollins, Ian MacKay. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone in Nausea, to me, if you ask H me. HR. <laughs> <laughs> HR, I think he's probably the most iconic. 
Yeah. In my opinion. I mean, that, that yeah, band that was, bat that, band, that band was unstoppable. That band was untouchable. Bad Brains are like probably my all time favorite. Yeah. Yeah. So back in the studio then, there was no click track, was there for this? Oh album? my God, no. I never knew what the hell a click track was until like, <laughs> like 22 years ago. I didn't know what a click track was until about four years ago. Well, that, you know, that's not true because I, I actually did play to a click track when I was in a band called Thorn, and that was in 92. That was after Nausea, and we, we played to that because we had synthesizers and, and sequencers and stuff. But I never really recorded with Thorn until then, and then after that, I kind of just did everything normally without that. Once I joined a band, like I joined Stone Sour in 2006, that's when everything was click track, even yeah. even in the studio. You know what I mean? Yeah. But like Soulfly and Crisis and stuff like that, those recordings were all live, like nausea. It's one thing I really loved about the Soulfly album. That was done pretty much how we did nausea, all in a room, live, bam, 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 you know? So how does overdubbing work when you don't have a click? I don't know. I mean, if, if your if your drummer's got you know you know good timing, then you don't really need it. You know, I try to keep keep my timing as solid as I can and keep it as consistent as I can, and then you know go from there. If there's a little bit of tempo change or you know higher you know slow slower fast. You know, it's, it's subtle. It's okay. All those records you grew up listening to have it. You know. Yeah. It's okay. Well, I like I like I like the I like the, the I like the live feel. It, there's nothing like it, you know. And but also embrace you know bands that record to the grid. You know, so it works for some bands. It wouldn't work for a band like Nausea. Nausea needs to be raw and and off the rails. You know, a band like Soulfly needs to be raw and off the rails. You know. Yeah. Well, that that just shows how much talent the band had because to have a six minute song like Technological to have only a short space to record it and to nail it so quickly. <laughs> you know what I mean? I never looked at it like that, but yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's pretty crazy. There's only, it's only on yeah. two reels, two uh, 16 track reels. Yeah. Uh, Victor said one of those is missing. Yes. I have the, I have the first reel, the second reel, John, John can't find it. And that's got extinction and black and dove and all that stuff. That's on that. Originally, what I wanted to do was take those reels and um, transfer them all, and I was I was going to personally remix it and you know put it through a desk and you know just give it, it give it a bit more crunch. But then we decided we can't do it because we don't have the second reel. So what's the point? So I found the the original uh, um, uh, stereo master of Don Fury's remix, and we went with that. And actually, it's a it's a great re it's a great remix. So there's nothing. Nothing needs to be done to it. Just use that. It's of the time. It's fine. And I just put it through mastering with uh, Jack Control from Enormous Door Mastering, which he's done a lot of a lot of uh, awesome records over the last like fifteen years. And he's he's killer. Yeah. Well, Victor said he was the one that mixed it, and he also said he had people standing over his shoulder while he was doing that. Were you one of those people? Nah, probably. I was kind of sitting back. And Watching everyone else crowd around him. <laughs> but, um, what did yeah, you he think? Did the, he, did the, he did the best he could. Um, obviously, it sounded different once we left that room. You know, it sounded probably great there. When we took it elsewhere, it just didn't sound right. He did the best yeah. he could. Well, do you think that's because in the studio, the speakers are much more expensive, have a specific rich quality to them? That when you take it outside of that, like in a home stereo system, it sounds kind of squished. No, and it's compressed different. Really. I mean, it depends. You know, if you have flat speakers that have a flat response, and or your control room is is you know treated, you know correctly, then you should have a you should have a decent mix and, and be able to play it anywhere and it sound good. You know. Yeah. Was the whole band kind of bummed out by the way it sounded? I think so. <laughs> I mean, I know John and I were. Um, yeah. yeah, that's why we went and had John Fury redo it because we were going to re-release it once Profane stopped putting it out. We, we were going to re-release it on, on uh, it was on, on Al's label, Allied, something like that. Um, it's called Extinction, the Second Coming. 
And it only came out on CD. It didn't even come out on, on vinyl or anything. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Yeah, you do have everything. That's cool. Yeah, I'm I'm a huge fan of the band. I, I love it so much. I, I was actually really nervous to talk to you today because I thought maybe you wouldn't want to talk about a band that you were in over 30 years I, ago. I love, you know? I, I love that, that part of my life. I, I have great fond memories of that, and I love that band. That was my first band I've ever done anything with. You know, I, you know, I, my first record was with that band. My first recording experience was with that band. My first touring experience was with that band. I mean, it's pretty special, you know. I did. I cut my teeth with that band. Yeah. And was the squatting community special to you at the time? Well, I was more like I didn't have a choice at one one time. You know, I, I lived. I lived in. I squatted for a minute before even like joining Nausea. I have to remember um, when I was living in Philly. I was kind of going back and forth to New York. And one day I just decided just to stay there with a friend that was living there. It was like in like dead of winter, like January of all times. So I, I stayed in this squat um, the first week or so. I was in New York in, on 7th Street between uh, uh, B and C. I can't remember the name of the squat, but it was on 7th Street. And then I ended up living on 11th Street squat between B and C for a couple months. And then, you know, trying to find work and bands to see what's going on or just to you know just to get in the scenes i really wanted to just do something in new york you know at the time because there's nothing really going on for me in philly i was in philly for like a year and i played a couple things there but nothing really stuck so that's why i was like you know what? i'm gonna go back to new york i want to find my way there and i did but then there was nothing there for me so then i ended up going back to new york and lived with my friend sean roberts who knew john and that's, you know, both, that's how, that's how I got back in, back up to New York, because to Sean, because he told me about nausea meeting a drummer. So that was my end. So I went back. Yeah. Do you miss that lifestyle at all? Uh, I couldn't see myself living like that now that I'm 54 years old. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could, I could do all that 19, 20 years old, you know, working two or three jobs and, trying to make ends meet living that way you know check you know pay to payday to payday i couldn't do that do i miss like just discovering all these new things in the scene and and just seeing things like you know like be created from like that time yeah i miss all that i miss the creativity i miss the i miss the just the whole like discovering new ways of playing meeting new people and just kind of figuring yourself out as as you're growing, you know. I missed I missed that. It's a it's a pretty cool uh, evolution to look back on. If that makes any sense. Yeah. You know? Well, are there any special memories that come to mind, like being on the road with this band? Like what specifically? <laughs> like the first time you went overseas. I know you went to Europe twice, maybe with the band. Yeah, my first official tour was was touring in europe before even touring america so yeah um we landed in holland amsterdam was like our home base uh because our, our tour manager and uh, booking agent people were living there so we stayed there and we kind of you know got our foot got our foot and put on the ground and you know got acclimated there and, and just uh just taking it all in you know what i mean we played every punk club and squat in Europe, like starting with the uh, uh, WNC in Groningen, Holland, and then playing the Rota Flora in Hamburg and, and Oppenstrasse, Studebaker squat. Played a lot of cool places, met a lot of cool people in Europe. And for me, it was, I was blown away. I mean, to even see street signs in different languages and meeting people from different countries and looking at all this different foreign currency, you know what I mean? There was no euros yet, so everyone had their own currency. You got, you actually had borders between countries. You got your, your passport stamps. You had to get out of the, you had to get out of your van or your car and go through customs or go through the passport uh, uh, office, you know, customs office or whatever. Um, each each uh, border patrol person is something else, you know. And the wall already has been down, I think, for a year and a half by that point. So, you know, Europe is still, Bit raw, especially in the Eastern Bloc, 
saw a lot of cool stuff there, a lot of interesting stuff. Um, toured Poland and Czech Republic and you know, all those places for the first time. It's pretty wild to see all that for the first time. Did you find that there was any trouble from like skinheads or police, like the as you would get that like in New York? Uh, I didn't have any run-ins with any skinheads in Europe that I can remember. Uh, the, yeah. No, um, there was one show, that um, thing you did. No, you weren't in the band at the time, I don't think. But yeah. there was um, there was like some racist skinheads that were trying to shut the show down and all that kind of thing. I do remember something like something sort of like that. We played in like Dresden or something. I think that might have happened in Dresden. Now you now that you're saying that, and uh, yeah, I don't think anything came of that. So, did you find that the police were a lot friendlier, like to the punks overseas? <laughs> Not really. I mean, I can remember playing uh, May Day in in Berlin, and like a bunch of police came in with water cannons and blew everyone off their stage <laughs> that we were playing on. And the big riot that could happen there in Kreuzberg. That was pretty brutal. No, they're not that nice. <laughs> <laughs> was, was that's, there something I'll, that's, a, that's something I'll never forget. Playing Mayday, um, a bunch of punk bands, and it was outdoors. It was in, in Lao Tzu's sort of Platz. It was like right in, the, in this little, like, grassy, like, park area of Kreuzberg. And I can remember when we were done, there was this, this Turkish band, this traditional Turkish band set up, like, like a few bands after us. They were on stage, and it was water cannons, and these police and right gear just like kind of pushing people out. And this water cannon was shooting straight at the stage, and blew these people off the stage. I thought it was the most fucked up thing I've ever seen in my life. I'll never forget that. People were picking up cobblestones from the streets, throwing them at the cops. I mean, it was fucking crazy. Was there a little part of you that was excited by the danger at the time? In a way, I guess so. In a way, yeah. <laughs> I was like, get, yeah, run. Oh, shit, okay. I was, I was standing just like, kind of like, the fuck is going on? And like, I remember someone grabbed me by the back of my jacket, like, come on, dude. So just kind of ran. Yeah. Well, one thing I didn't get into mm -hmm. with Victor was the recording of, like, the Cyber God and the Life Cycle 7 inches. Mm -hmm. What was the re um, recording process like for those? Um, I think that's something that I... I, I arranged uh because at the time i was playing with this uh the band called the of cabbages and kings and they recorded at the studio that we were at uh, it was, uh, it was wharton tears studio fun city wharton tears did a lot of bands like cabbages and kings i think he did some work with sonic youth like those those kind of bands like the more no wave kind of bands in new york uh wharton was also a drummer in glenn Bronco's band another no wave band from new york so he was a killer engineer. He's part of the whole no, no wave scene. Um, of Cabbages and Kings is uh, Al Just Kizzy's, the bass player from the Swans. I was playing drums for them. And they had just recorded one of their records there, a, band, a record called Basic Pain, Basic Pain, Basic Pleasure. And we were ready to record new stuff. And I, and I asked I asked him, like, where'd you record your records? They recorded it at Morton Tears. And though he's Glenn Bronco's drummer, uh, he's done Helmet, he's done a record. I'm like, great, that's where I want to go. Because I loved all those bands. I loved Sonic Youth, Swans. I loved that whole scene of music. So I thought it'd be cool to bring our band in that situation with someone who knew what they were doing. You know? So we brought our music in there. Wharton engineered it. He mixed it. And it was a really cool experience. It was a weird room. I remember it being a really long, narrow room. When you first walk in, it was in the basement of his apartment that he lived in. So you walk in, in the control room, you take a left, and it's this long, narrow hallway of a room. So when you walk in, it's just the guitar player, then the bass player, and the drums are all the way at the end. And then there was this kitchenette room off to the side where he had a microphone in there with compression, cranked the fuck on it to give it some reverb. So that's the reverb that you hear on that. It's all natural. And that was all one take as well we only i think we practiced it a couple times and then we recorded it and that was it do you remember who wrote the lyrics 
I think it was a, I think it was Al, Albanisha, Al, and Amy together. I'm not sure. I'm almost positive it was them, both of them together. Yeah. Well, I can imagine the whole band was more satisfied with how that recording came out. Yeah. It's funny. Those lyrics resonate now more than it did then. <laughs> <clears throat> Musically, John John John's the one who wrote all that stuff. Well, did anything happen between the recording of Cyber God and Life Cycle, like comp tracks or demos? Maybe I think maybe you went on tour in between there. Yeah, actually, I, that's when we went to the West Coast and did our West Coast tour in uh, 1990. Actually, no, that's not true. We did that West Coast tour just before or after the Cyber God record. And that was the only time we did another extensive tour. We did, we did three major tours. We did two European tours and one West Coast tour. And everything else is just weekend shows, you know, like playing in the tri-state area, as they say, like Boston or Connecticut or Rhode, Rhode Island or Philly, you know what I mean? That's it. We didn't do a lot. We played locally and we played like at ABC in Rio, Port Seabees, you know, shit like that. And then we recorded Life Cycle. And do you ever find yourself going back and, and watching those old live videos on YouTube? Sometimes. I mean, like when people like send me like, you know, here's, hey, check this picture out or hey, here's this footage. And then I'll go down a rabbit hole on YouTube and then discover that there's all these other videos I never saw before. Where it's just like, wow, I remember that show. And that's so cool. Like there's like shows from like Poland on there from our first tour. There's another show from Germany on YouTube from like our first tour, you know, stuff like that. There's lots of pictures out there from, you know, from, I think Jim Martin took a lot of pictures. The guy, Jim, that was with us. He was our, 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 our tech roadie friend and helped us with, you know, gear and all that and drove the van and he took a lot of pictures. Um, yeah, it's cool when you, when you get the, when you get those things and you, when you come across those things, it's, it's great that it's documented. It's out there. It's nice, you know, yeah, for sure. It's nice to know that it's, still acknowledged you know what i mean mm. we're more acknowledged now and i think we were even then so where were you guys then we needed you then <laughs> you know I, I think the band's more popular now than it was then yeah I mean, there's i mean ever, ever, people it's great it's cool when you when i'm walking through different cities or towns throughout the world and i'll see like a kid with a nausea patch i'm like that's cool yeah. keeping that band's name alive you know that's it's awesome it's a legacy and now this now that now now record label like smart records wants to take on our, our music and give it a home. That's great too. Now everyone can get it, you know? Yeah. Did Amy leave the band, like in the middle of the life cycle recording? She left the band, she left the band right before that. Um, yeah, that wasn't, that was kind of a, kind of a downer that, that all went down like that. I wish, I wish uh, we all could have just made that work. Um, yeah, once once that happened, I'll be honest, like I really wasn't into it anymore because her energy in that band to me was missing when she left. It was I just didn't didn't feel it. I don't think the crowd did either. I could tell, you know. Her presence, her voice like was fucking missing when she when she was gone, you know. It sucked. I didn't like it. Yeah. Well, like I say, man, Amy's the whole reason that I discovered the band in the first place. But as that whole thing was coming to an end, were you just joining other bands while trying to continue with Nausea and then that just kind of fizzled out? Well, I think after Life Cycle, we played a couple of shows like that with, without Amy. And I think we just we just called it after that. Some of us weren't getting along with each other and broke up. You know, and then John and I went to form Thorn with uh, Stefan from Winter. Um, Victor joined Chaos UK. It's funny how that happened. Um, Gabba from Chaos K was in America just, you know, hanging out. He went to go hang out with Poison Idea or even record with them, I think. And he spent all his money, couldn't get back home, stayed at my house for a little bit, he stayed at a bunch of people's houses. So, we came up with the idea of why don't we reform the band, you know, just the three of us, Nausea guys, and you, you, we'll play Chaos UK songs. We'll play a couple shows under Chaos USA, raise some money, get your ass back home. And that's what we did. And I think through that is what gave Gabba the idea to take Victor along for Chaos UK. 
Yeah. Yeah. Good move. Victor fucking kicked ass in that band. Yeah. He made some great fucking records with that band. Yeah, man. You all kick ass in any band that you join. I mean, <laughs> thanks. I don't think there's a bad band that any member of Nausea has ever been in. Appreciate that. Even Victor's new uh, band, Coffin Daggers, was not so new. He's had it for a few years. They're great. Like, like they're full on surf. Got this Dick Dale thing going on. Like, Victor's just the like, talented, amazing guitarist. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if you heard any of it, but it's great. Oh, yeah, they came out with a new album a few years ago, didn't they? Mm -hmm. He has a recording studio. He's got a really cool analog studio, like fully analog tape. I haven't been there, but he's told me a lot about it. And it sounds like it's a pretty cool spot. Yeah. Yeah. So what was the first, like, holy shit moment in your life when you'd realized you'd just joined the biggest band at that point? Um, when I first joined Soulfly... And stepping out on a on a bigger stage, with more production and a bigger PA, and stepping onto a bus, that was the holy shit moment. Or stepping out on a stage on a big festival with, they like, say, like I think Shelter was probably the holy shit moment. And I, I was playing drums at Shelter in like mid '90s, like '96. I played my first big open air festival with that band, and that was the holy shit moment. I mean, I never played that front of that many people in my life i mean until that point it was probably about 90,000 80,000 people there it's fucking crazy we we're opening up for venom <laughs> okay venom was the the headliner they they just got back together as the original three uh mantis abaddon and chronos so it was for me it was a big deal because i love venom so i couldn't believe i was on the same stage with that band you know i'm calling everybody at home you're not gonna believe who i'm fucking playing with <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, it was good. It was killer. Even I, there's video footage actually of that Dynamo show with me playing Shelter of me smiling, kind of like, like, just shocked. Like that's a true smile of like, holy shit. My holy shit moment is on, on camera. Like my reaction of holy shit. Yeah, if you, you, it's out there. You'll see it. I'm just like, wow, you know, <laughs> cool shit. So, I think White Devil, White Devil was on that too. That's Harley Flanagan in the Paris uh, Maze band after Chromax. They were on that bill too. Remember that? I borrowed cymbals off their drummer, Dave DeCenzo. They didn't have any cymbals. <laughs> Random thoughts. Are there many people from the old hardcore days that you've still kept in touch with? Yeah, I mean, like occasionally, you know, chime in, you know, Jimmy Gestapo or Vinny. Stigma, Roger, you know, guys like that, you know. Do you, do you yeah. still listen to that music for pleasure? Absolutely. I throw Victim yeah. of Pain on. Yeah. I throw I throw Dehumanization by Crucifix on. I throw on Hear Nothing, Discharge. I throw on Black Flag. I throw on Dead Kennedys. I throw on fucking Rain and Blood Slayer too, you know. I mean, I, I still listen to all that shit. Just to get some inspiration here and there, you know. I listen to a lot of new stuff too, but I do go back and listen to that stuff. Or I'll go back yeah. and listen to the 70s rock stuff that I grew up listening to. I'll listen to Kiss. I'll listen to ACDC or Thin Lizzy and Black Sabbath, Zeppelin, yeah. Floyd, Pink Floyd. Like, that's my shit. Yeah. Or I'll throw on some electronic music. I'll listen to Kraftwerk, you know, or Tangerine Dream or Van Gelis, Blade Runner soundtrack. I'll listen to shit like that, you know, or world music. I'll listen to Moroccan music. It's for inspiration for drumming and stuff, you know. Yeah. I mean, we love all kinds of music, but what do you think the drive is to play fast? Why is it so exciting? At that time, it, at that time, it was like, who could be faster? Who could play this? Who could that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that was the drive. I mean, and then just listening to bands like, like I said, like Slayer and The Accused or, you know, shit like that, like fast music like that, you know, Crucifix even, that, that drove me. I wanted, I wanted to play like that. That's exciting, you know? I can achieve that, you know. I wasn't, you know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't be like the virtuoso drummer that I wanted to be, like, you know, like Neil Peart. Like, who's gonna play like that, like right out the box? I can't, but I can play like that. That's that's I can achieve that. That sounds cool too. And it's it's angry. It's 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 fast. It's great. Yeah. 
fuck yeah. So I went for it. So when you joined bands like Stone Sour, did you find that they were nausea fans? Like, did they want you in the band because of that? No, no, they, they're they're none of they weren't nausea fans. They didn't even really come from punk. I mean, they they they're more rock metal guys. You know, what I mean, they come from Midwest Iowa. Um, they weren't really aware of nausea. I mean, I think I got into that band just from word of mouth and just from the same. We know the same people and. We worked with a lot of the same people and they needed someone at the time and I was there and they called me, you know, that's how it worked. And it worked out and I, and I ended up ended up being in a band for with them for with Corey, Jim and, and Josh for like 14 years, you know, we made seven records with them. It did pretty good with that band. They were great. Loved playing with them. I miss those guys too. I haven't played with them in five years, six years, you know. Well, you're in ministry now, aren't you? Yes, now I'm in ministry. So were they fans of Nausea? Well, people who know ministry are definitely more aware of Nausea. These guys in the band are. Al is. Yeah. Yeah. So could you talk us through how those Nausea reunions panned out? Because they they never really happened, did they? We tried to, we tried to make it happen. It just... Just didn't work out, you know. I mean, we've we even gone as far as recording new stuff. Like Vic and John, John and I got together at my my studio, like in 2015, like seven, eight, you know, 15, almost ten years ago, nine years ago. Um, recorded six or seven songs that could potentially be newer stuff, and they're sitting on the shelf still. <laughs> ah. I mean. We tried back then to, to at least put the band together for a couple of shows. It just didn't work out. It wasn't the right time. Amy yeah. was busy and Al was busy. You know, everyone was busy with life. So. So what do you think is going to happen with those songs then? Will you ever like do like a sneaky release? I'd love to. I mean, I'd love to get <clears throat> Amy or Al to sing on it at least, you know. We, 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 we try to get other people to do it, but it just didn't really work and anyways if we were to really do it i think we'd probably get together again and record newer stuff because that's stuff i listen to it now it's like it's good but i think we can come up with more and better the fact that we got together as the three of us that that, at that time it felt like no time has passed it was great we got in a room together still we still got our still got our thing you know still got the chemistry still there and it's cool to hear what we sound like now as opposed to when we were 19 and 20. We were by then 45, 48, 49 years old, you know what I mean? Yeah. At that time. Mm. It's cool. It's cool to hear what we sound like. So if Nausea hadn't broken up, what do you think would have happened to the sound like in the mid to late 90s? I don't know. Oh, well, I mean, just just judging by songs like Cyber God and, and, and uh, Body of Christ, it probably would have went more that way. Probably went a little bit more metalish, maybe. I don't know. I think we had a good combination of that with punk and metal fixed mixed together. We, we didn't think about it; we just did it, and it came out that way. You know, it came out yeah. sounding like that. Yeah. Well, do you remember anyone reaching out to you about the anthologies? No, I think I think that's more John. John put that together. Yeah. And I just I was like, I was just basically in the background going, cool, let's do it. You know, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't I didn't have much to, to do with that. I have more to, John, John and I have more to do with the, the latest releases that are that are coming out. Like we're, we've been handling that. Is there much you can say about that or is it all secret stuff? Oh, it's not secret. I mean, it's public knowledge. It's coming out on Smart Records. It's a label from Finland. Um, they're releasing, releasing uh, both seven inches on one, uh, 12 inch you know, EP it'll be streaming it'll be down it'll be a uh, you know download whatever but I think it's a limited uh, uh, vinyl press and a couple colors and then we're gonna we're gonna put out the we're gonna put out the first album again yeah is it just gonna be those songs or are you gonna like sneak some bonus stuff on there Cause we, we don't really have anything else other than that a lot of the live recordings I, I I mean, I think there's, there might be one out there that might be really good. Maybe we could put that on there. I know Vic, I know, has a bunch of our live recordings. 
He's got one specifically I think is great, which is the Gilman Street show that we did with uh, Neurosis and uh, Connor Christ and uh, another band called uh, Glisten Max. We were on tour with Glisten Max, that whole West Coast tour. And we, there was a recording, a four track recording of that, of that show. And that came out great, I remember. Yeah. So maybe that can be put out one day. So on this reissue of Extinction, then, do you know if that's going to come out on CD? Um, I don't know. Maybe. I hope Depends. so. Like, I hope so, too. I mean, I mean, I know there's a lot of people that don't have record players. There's a lot of people that don't want to stream it. They want a physical copy. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure it'll be on CD. I'll have to go as far as putting it on cassette. But apparently cassette is like the new thing again. This is crazy to me. <laughs> So if it does come out on CD, are we going to get like a different artwork to the original LP, like some notes and stuff? Yeah, we're making new artwork to it. We're not, it's not going to be like that cover. I mean, we're definitely working on new artwork for it. You know, that's still relevant to, you know, the original artwork. Um, yeah, we're going to change up some things. Hmm. So there's a so there's a, an actual difference between the two, you know. Yeah. So you're not just getting a repeat of exactly that record. It sounds... Yeah a lot different to the original mix and not in a bad way. It sounds way more aggressive if anything. Oh, okay. Like really aggressive sounding compared to what it used to sound like. It's, it's like I said, it's the, it's the tone that I've always wanted to hear this record with that it never had. Now it does. So you've actually heard like the final versions. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm involved with the mastering. I've been going back and forth with this. With the engineers because i have okay. i have the original i have the original recording of it but since that one reel is missing like how's that happened what i have is a master stereo uh print of it of don fury's mix i don't have the multi i have the multi-tracks but i don't have i can't mix them because i only have one reel but uh, okay i have the original uh two track two two track stereo mix of what Don Fury did. Okay, and that's what I, I used. What you have is that. Yeah. So I took that unmastered version of it, gave it to a mastering engineer, and he brought the volume up, crunched it a bit more, and just sounds more aggro. Uh, okay. It's got an edge. It's got a really good edge to it now. I'm happy with it. I think everybody else will be happy with it too. Do we have an estimation of when that's coming out? I, I don't know. It could be it, hopefully this year. I'm sure this year sometime. We're still working on it. Yeah. So you dig in the whole ministry thing, then? Are you going to continue with this band for as long as possible? Yeah, I'm gonna for as long as possible. I mean, I just made I just made a record with them. It just came out. Um, I feel like about a week ago. Uh, Hopium for the masses. Check it out. Yeah, man. I'll I made be, the I'll I made be. the last I'm, I made the last couple records with them. I was, I was on the first record I was on with Ministry was Americans, and I was on the last one, Moral Hygiene, and now this one. Yeah, I've been with them on and off since 2016. Do you have any plans to join any other huge bands? No, I mean I'm I'm just I'm just working with Ministry right now, and I do other. I do other work. I mean, I was actually have another band also with Stig from Amoebix and JJ from Discharge, a band called False Fed. That's another album that just came out on uh, New Rock Records on uh, Neurosis' label. And then now, just recently, I just made a record with the Melvins called Tarantula Heart, and that's coming out in April. Me and Dale Grover doing double drums on the whole record. What? <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. Dude. And, um, also just made a, uh, was part of a tribute record for The Residents um, that just came out as well. Yeah. Okay. Pretty busy this year. <laughs> Who would you say are the drummers to watch out for? Like who's ripping it up these days? Mario Duplantia from Gojira. One of my new favorite drummers right now. And he's a really good, really cool person. Um, He's he's great. You guys gotta check out that band. Yeah. They mean business. They mean fucking business. Is that a punk band or some kind of flashy metal? They're their own breed of metal. Put it that way. They're from France. 
the singer, uh, which is the brother of, uh, of Mario, sometimes comes off sounding a bit like uh, Jazz Coleman at times, which is really cool. And but their band's got this crazy intricate fucking version of of metal I've I've never heard before. You need to hear it. It's great. Very polyrhythmic, but very musical, very groovy. Yeah, check it out. Yeah. So, are you still playing a little bit of everything these days? Like a little bit of guitar, a little bit of bass. You you use those to write. Yeah, I still write on guitar, bass. Um, I still play bass. Uh, I write on. I do a lot of composing as well. I mean, I compose music for film. Um, I use a lot of hardware synthesizers. I use, uh, you know orchestral sample libraries, like Vienna Instruments. I use all that stuff to write um, film score stuff with. Like uh, the Studio 666 film, uh, that Foo Fighters movie, I, that's the last film I did. You can hear what I do on that. That's all synthesizers and, and uh, or- orchestral uh, instruments. Yeah. Was that the biggest film that you've worked <clears throat> on so far? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I've done, <clears throat> I've done several some a couple of haven't you know seen the light of day and some are just more obscure and underground and i just recently finished one for spider one from uh power man 5000 he just made a new movie called little bites that's coming out um this year hopefully um but yeah studio 666 is, is definitely the biggest film I ever was ever a part of and i also include john carpenter who made halloween and the fog and escape from new york he did the theme song in the movie but i did the rest of the music oh, okay yeah. so he, i mean for me to work with that guy is i mean <clears throat> i never thought ever um he's a huge influence and probably one of the main reasons why i love to do what i do with composing for film guys like him uh wendy carlos who did some of the music for uh for the shining and did all the music for clockwork orange you know shit like that um Christoph Pendereski, he's like a more modern composer. Uh, Baghetti, Bartok, those kind of guys. Like, I would really love listening to that. Bernard Herman, who did all the music for uh, Alfred Hitchcock movies. Yeah. Jerry Goldsmith. Yeah, I can go on and on and on. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like you've got an amazing life going for you. Yeah. I mean, it took a lot of hard work to get where I'm at. And, you know, I'm still working. I'm not. Not stopping, you know, keep moving, you know, keep building, keep learning, never stop. Yeah. Well, since you mentioned the Foo Fighters, then I did want to ask you what you thought of Josh Freeze being in the band because he's one of the craziest drummers of all time. Oh my God. <clears throat> he's one of the best in the business, man. He wouldn't be getting the calls if he wasn't. I mean, I'm not surprised, you know, that he's in that seat. He fucking kills it, man. It's amazing with him. I haven't seen him live with the band yet. I'm dying to see it live. I mean, I've only seen video footage and it's great, but I can't only imagine how awesome it must be to watch it, you know. Um, the last time I actually saw Booze with Taylor was actually at the the Studio 666 uh, red carpet party. So we, we, we had a showing at the Mass Chinese and in L.A. And everybody that was at the, at the, the red carpet was invited to see the band play down the street at the Fonda Theater, and that was the last time I saw the Taylor play. And it was great. I didn't get to see him, unfortunately. I really wanted, you know. Yeah. We knew each other, and uh, yeah, it just sucks. He's not here anymore. Yeah. If I could just mention Brooks Wackerman. Love Brooks. I know Brooks really well. Great fucking drummer. Yeah, He's kicking ass in Avenge, Avenge Sevenfold. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's in that band now. Oh Dude. yeah, he's been with he's been with them for a while. But did you check out like um, his bad religion stuff? Oh yeah, actually, now another friend of mine is in that. Sorry, hang on. Um, Jamie Miller is now playing uh, drums for Bad Religion. Another great drummer that you should check out. He used to be in a really cool band called Snot, like about twenty some years ago. And then he had another band with his wife uh, Amy in this band called The Start, where he played guitar. Um, then after that, now he's in Bad Religion, fucking killing it. Great drummer. Yeah, man. Amazing drummer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, just wrapping up then, the Punk Rock Museum, um, what are your thoughts on it? Did you contribute anything to it? 
Oh yeah, <clears throat> I actually was. I was actually a, a tour guide for a few for a few days during in July, just past July. I love it. It's great. Um, some of my stuff is living there. Uh, my couple of my drum, my some of my drums are living there from what I used in Nausea. Our Nausea backdrop is in there, in the New York hardcore section of of Punk Rock Museum. I think it's great, man. Um, it's it's done really well. Fat Mike, you know, is kicking ass with it, and it's a pretty cool little little uh, nod to all the cool bands that, you know, that put in a lot of hard work into the scene. And yeah, it's it's there. It's living there. It's great. Yeah, man. Yeah. I have no problem with it. There's, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of people out there that, that, you know, piss and moan about it. I don't know why, but I mean, I think it's. I think it's fucking awesome. Yeah, man. I think it it does belong in a museum now because you know it's been over fifty years that punk rock's been around. It belongs in a museum. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Absolutely. It deserves to be there. It, de- it deserves. All that, all those artifacts, all those guitars, his clothes, deserves a place to, to to live in, you know, and to be on display. Why not? You know? Yeah, man. And um, nausea is on Instagram now. Like you guys have got that new Instagram page. Well, I don't know how new it is. Maybe a year and a half old. Uh, we, we we've had it for a year, a couple of years, something like that. Yeah. Is it everyone in the band that runs it? Just John and I. Oh, okay. Yeah, John and I are the ones that run it. Yeah. Well, people should definitely go check that out. I'll give them links like uh, in the description and stuff. Because there's some rare pictures on there that I've never seen. I thought I'd seen every single picture there was of the band. There was actually a lot of pictures in there I've never seen before either that, that, that John John just finds. And a lot of them are his too that he's that he's had and taken. We get a lot of cool photos also from Chris Bortz who did a lot of our photos at the time. A lot of her photos are in there, and this random stuff from different people from other parts of the world that send, you know, photos. Put them up. Some cool stuff in there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for doing this. Um, I really mean that. You are one of my all-time favorite drummers to drum along to. Oh man. I can't stress that enough. Like. <laughs> I appreciate that, man. I can't believe you've just like sat here for an hour talking to me. <laughs> well, just. Make me look cool on your video, man. <laughs> yeah, man. God damn it. Yeah. Well, hey, man. Really great to talk to you, too, man. I appreciate it. And thanks for supporting what I do and getting it. Well, I'm definitely going to buy all the new Nausea reissues, so I'm excited about them. You're going to dig it, dude. I'm telling you. It's it's night and day. I love yeah, it. Yeah, man. Yeah. All right, well. Thanks so much, dude, for doing this, and uh, we'll catch you later. Keep doing what you're doing. I appreciate that, man. All right, brother. You too. Yeah, man. Later, homie. Be good. Yeah, man. You too.